All right, good morning, everyone. Hey, we are back online, and I want to thank Grant and for his great help. You know, we had uh, the problem of us not being online the last couple of weeks. We found out that our router was outdated, and we needed to get a new router, so we got warp speed, and uh, we're excited about that. So thank you for, if you those are watching online, thank you for being patient with us, and thank you for the testimonies and comments of you that watch the service later. And we just want to bless you this morning and just want to put up a quick slide before we enter into worship today and we want and this is for those that are here and those that are especially online is we have a on November 14th we're going to have a happy friends giving here at the church you know we want to in this next season as I've been taking time to fast and pray one of the key words on my heart is, is community and fellowship so this is one way we're going to start that you know, happy friends giving. But for those of you watching online, and I know some of you up there, you've said that you wanted to come to Living Hope Church. So if you're watching online, either now or later, I want to encourage you to pray about driving up to Mora on this Sunday. And right after service, we're going to have a meal. And we're going to have a Thanksgiving. So if those of you that are online, you're a part of our church family as well. And what a great day for you that watch online to come up to a Sunday service, but actually have a meal with us in your, in your church family. We will want to extend an invitation for you and your families online to join us as well as those that are in our house and body and you know and, and just to invite people to come that day just to celebrate what God's been doing so that's coming up and we just have a lot of other things that that God's putting on our hearts in the next season as we build on that community fellowship 
thing because that's what we need right now. And just want to encourage you too, if God ever puts somebody on your heart, reach out to them. You know, we all have a responsibility to connect. And, you know, God puts people on my heart every day. I call, email, connect, pray. You know, we all have a responsibility in the body to connect. Take somebody out to lunch. Take somebody out to coffee. You know, that's how, that's how we build relationship. And all of us have a responsibility for that. And, and if you're not an extrovert like me, just find one person. I know introverts don't like to be around a lot of people, but hey, find that one person that God has put on your heart. And, and I want to extend this. I said this before. Those of you that may have difficulty connecting with people in the community that need Jesus, or maybe you're not at a, a confident level because whatever, or maybe you're not at the place where, you, you know, you want to pray with somebody, etc. you know, leverage me, please. You know, if you're praying for a co-worker and you know they need healing and you know the 100 plus cancer healings in this church, you should leverage that. Leverage that to your advantage. If you're watching online, call me up. Put me in contact with somebody because you know what? That's how the kingdom is. That's how we partner in the kingdom together. Where, where you're lacking, someone else can provide. Like if you know someone operates in a certain gift set, leverage that and, and vice versa. You know, that's how we build each other up. So I want to encourage you this next season as you're praying for people in our city community. And if you run across people that need healing, that need, that need encouragement, hey, Invite your friend out to lunch and invite me so we can make a connection. Now, let's make that happen. Come on, somebody. That's how you build the kingdom, church. You don't sit at home and twiddling your thumbs expecting someone to come to you. We got to go to them as part of kingdom as we go. And, and if you have trouble going, <laughs> grab a friend and say, hey, I don't have confidence in this area, but could you join me in this situation? Because I'm praying for this friend for years and I'm having a struggle to connect. Hey, Bring somebody along with you. It could be me or somebody in the body. If you're a woman, bring my wife. I mean, we're all, that's how we build kingdom, church. You know, and God wants, that's how we grow, that's how we establish. So that's something we got to build on in this next season is learning how to leverage each other's gifts, talents, and abilities for the kingdom. And that's how we pull on each other in these times. So it's one of the, I mean, I just felt there was a, such a holy ghost on that. And that's what I've been praying for this next season. And we know we're all, we all got the lane that God's called us to walk in. And, you know, I can't walk in someone else's lane, but I can walk in mine. And every once in a while, we got to get off our lane to maybe jump in someone else's and encourage and strengthen and, and build. You know, in this season, man, there's a lot of hurt. There's a, there's a lot of pain. It does take a prophet to prophesy that, but it does take a prophet to prophesy the treasure in the pain. So let's be that. And let's do that. And, and maybe God is calling you to the pain. What pain is God calling to? What hurt is God calling you to? Not, not, not they're criticizing or judging it, but hey, maybe God is calling you to jump into the pain because you have the answer for the pain. And we know Jesus works through you and your gifts to make that happen. So, and as for your testimony, we've been talking about that, your testimony and the pain that God has brought you through is the testimony and comfort that you need to bring someone else through. And so that's what we got to do in this next season, church. That's how we're going to reach a city. That's how we're going to build a church is, is by asking, Lord, Lord, what are you calling me into and what are you calling me to bring to the table? That's how we grow. That's how we establish. And, and if we just want to sit back and let somebody else do it, well, hey, come on, somebody. That's not how the church grows. We all have to be engaging in this season. And that's why the sermon series we've been doing, it's about a process of the heart. Because you remember this phrase, hurting people hurt people. Why are, we, why are we becoming emotionally strong in this season? It's because God wants to deal with the wounds and the hurts of our life. He wants us to find healing there so that we could be useful in the next season. You know, if you're hurting and you're, not, and you're not getting through the hurt, how can God use you? You may be available, but how can God use you if you're still hurting? So that's the season we're in. God's in a process of healing his bride, healing his church, reestablishing some things so that when the next season opens up before us, we're going to be able to take advantage of all those opportunities because we've done the work now for the blessing later. So, Father, I just pray this morning as we worship you, we ask your Holy Spirit to come. You're here, but we welcome you today. Father, we want more. Lord, that's the cry of my heart. Lord, my prayer today is that you create a hunger and you create a thirst for more of you in this season. Father, I pray, God, that you, Lord, open up the heavens and come down on this place. Father, minister and move on the hearts of your people. Do the gentle surgery that we all need in this season. 
Father, you're the gentle healer who points out things, reminds us of things. You're the one who leads us to repentance. You're the one who takes us back to apply the blood to our past to bring healing to our future. So, Father, as we worship, may we engage your presence. May we just engage your presence so that you could speak to us and reveal yourself to us so that you could do the work you want to do. And, Lord, your word says in Philippians, he who began a good work will carry it out to full completion. Father, may the work that you've begun in our church and our lives, Father, may we be around to see the completion of that work. Father, we thank you today. We thank you today for who you are and what you're doing in this season. Father, we thank you for the healings and the miracles that you're pouring out. We thank you for the divine appointments that you're opening doors and that we're able to walk through. And God, we give you praise. And Father, we declare we want more. Father, create more divine appointments. Open up more opportunities for us to step into some things. And so, Father, we just ask you this morning, Father, your word says, and you're the one who causes all things to grow. So, Father, I'm asking you to grow us in this season. Grow us wider and deeper and stronger. Father, grow your people, grow your church, grow us in to this thing that you're calling us to in the next season. Father, may we grow into that like, like, like firm, not loose-fitting clothing and not tight fit, but just right. That as we grow through this season, you're going to create some clothing for us that's going to be nice. And we're going to step into something new. We're going to step into something that it's not going to be too tight and it's not going to be too loose, but it's going to be just right. So, Father, we just thank you today that, you're, it, that you have put us in a process of making us spotless and blameless bride. Father, that's the cry of our heart, that we would be spotless and that we would be blameless as we walk through this season. That as people look at us as individuals, and as people look at our church, they're going to say, wow, God's working there. God is living there. God is dwelling there. Why? Because we're making ourselves available to you, Lord. We're putting ourselves on your altar. We're saying, God, work in our lives. Examine our hearts. Examine our thoughts. Pull back the curtain of everything that's evil in our lives and wicked. And Lord, deal with it. Heal us. Deliver us. Lead us into the promised land of our life that you have planned for each and every one of us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let, let's amen. worship the Lord this morning. Good morning. Here's an aha moment. Are you ready for that? See, I, I have a few more gray hairs of wisdom coming in, and when he was speaking, this wisdom came to me. No, it's actually other people have said it. You do not harvest in the barn. So if we're not in the community and we're not witnessing to our family and friends, we can't expect the harvest to happen because most of the already harvest fruit is in the barn. And once in a while, the Lord will send somebody that isn't, but most of the time it is. <clears throat> so we need to get out in our communities. We need to share. I love one of the ladies uh, last weekend said she, she walks through the mall, and when she's praying, sometimes she'll pray in the spirit or whatever, she'll have her phone out, and she'll pretend like she's, and she's praying in the spirit, so they think she's praying in a different language, or talking in a different language. Find ways, because we pray that. Um, Lou that, that uh, comes with us, she does that all the time. She looks for that ripe seed that's right in front of her, and God is always faithful to bring those that, he's, that are ready for, to be harvested. He brings them to her. So if we do that and we move along, Father, we're just so grateful. So grateful for all that you do, Lord. I'm a little loud, sorry. Oh, I can't get enough. I can't get enough of your amazing love. No, I can't get enough. I can't walk away. No, I can't walk away. I've seen 
your face Lord, I can't walk away nothing like your love Lord there is nothing like your love I just want to be where you are I just want to be near your home there is nothing like your love Lord, there is nothing like your love. can't get enough Lord I can't get enough of your amazing love Lord I can't get enough I can't walk away Lord, I can't walk away For I've seen your face No, I can't walk away I just want to be where you are I just want to be near you There is nothing like your love Lord, there's nothing like your love I just want to be Oh, I just want to be where you are I just want to be near you There is nothing like your love Lord, there is nothing like your love. Jesus, I love you. We're singing, oh, 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 Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you.
Jesus, we love you. Oh, we love you. We're singing holy, 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 Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we love you. We 
singing holy, 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 Jesus, we love you, Jesus, we love you. Majestic Lord, you are greater than all we face. You are greater than all we face. The troubles that we feel, Lord, they disappear before your face. Your majestic Lord, your powerful Lord, all the troubles that we face disappear before your face. Have your way. Lord, have your way. We want to see your face. We want to see your loving face. Lord, have your way. see your loving face have your way you're more real than the wind in my lungs you're more real than the ground I'm standing on you're more real you're more real than the wind in my lungs you're more Thoughts define me, you're inside me, you're my reality. Belong to you. 
Closer than the skin on my bone Closer than the song on my tongue Your thoughts define me you're inside me of my reality Oh, yeah, my reality Let's tell them this morning, yeah, Abba, I belong to you. Oh, you're singing, Abba, I belong to you. You came running. You came running down my prodigal road You came running with a ring and a roll And grace is the collision on our way back home To the arms of a father who won't let go Father, who let go. Abba, I belong to you. Abba, I belong. Think of prodigal as those that are away from Father, those that are away from God. I really feel the Lord saying this morning that sometimes we can be prodigals in our rebellion or in our lack of moving when Father tells us to move. That there's phases of prodigalism that doesn't necessarily mean you're away from God, but some of us the heaviness of life has stopped us from our flow. The enemy has stolen our flow. So we're a prodigal. We're not living in that rich household of God's mercy and his grace. But we're in the pig pen of life that the enemy has thrown us into. And I really believe what the Lord is saying this morning is he's waiting on the porch. He's waiting on the porch for us to turn around and start walking back home. And he will come running down that dusty road with a ring and a robe. 
And he'll say, you are my beloved. You are Hephzibah. My delight is in you. It's the enemy that convinces us that we have to live and be a certain way. But our loving father says, come home, child. Come home. I'm waiting on the porch for you. I'm waiting on the porch for you. I'm looking down that long, dusty road. I'm waiting to catch just a glimpse of the cadence of your walk as you move towards me. And I will come running, says the Lord. Drop everything and run to him. It's at the foot of the cross. It's at his feet. Mary desired the good thing. And that was to be at the master's feet. So we need to lay our lives down before him. Pastor Steve asked me to share this because I think this is pertinent to what God is doing. Yesterday, I have all these shoes um, for various reasons. But they, in, and with the hardwood floors, they tend to collect dirt. So we were cleaning, get this, we were cleaning the bedroom, right? And behind my shoes are these little dust bunnies, and they're running away as quick as I can sweep them up. And somewhere a little bit into that, the Holy Spirit said, fast, pray, focus. Fast and pray and focus. And so I was being obedient. When I came in this morning, Pastor Steve said, that's it, Larry. He said, we need to fast, we need to pray, and we need to focus so that he can go inside of all of those dark spots that we have. Some of us don't even know they're there. And he can remove them from our lives. But the only way he can is if we humble ourselves and submit ourselves to him. The Bible says, submit yourself therefore unto God. Resist the devil. And he will flee from you. He will flee from you. So we're going to do one here by Brandon Lake called Living Sacrifice. So I didn't mean for you all to endure a mini sermon, but I'm feeling like this whole thing God has just orchestrated. And he's orchestrated it for each and every one of you, everyone online, everyone that's here, everyone that will watch it later. He has those opportune, they're called kairos moments. Kronos is what we live in. They're time, right? It's time Minutes, hours, days, months, and years. But then we hit a Kairos moment. And God says, don't miss your moment of visitation. Do not miss your moment of visitation. Because it's a very short Kairos moment. And if we will move in it, we will move according to what the Holy Spirit wants. If not, we have to wait for it to come around again. So don't miss your Kairos moment. Be willing to lay it all on the altar today. Be willing to put your whole life on the altar today and say, Lord, whatever you want, whatever you need, Father, I'm here. Here am I, Lord. Here am I, Lord. Send me, Lord. Send us, Lord. All on the altar. Surrendered again Oh, freely I lay down My everything Lord, this is my honor The gift that I bring And I will be a living sacrifice All my heart and soul to glorify I offer nothing less than all my life For Jesus Christ All on the altar again All on the altar Surrendered again 
Lord, freely I lay down my everything. Oh, this is my honor, the gift that I bring, and I will be a living sacrifice all my heart and soul to glorify I offer nothing less than all my life for Jesus Christ I just want to bless you I just want to bless you Whatever it takes With my mind and my body My spirit and strength Oh Lord, if you are a fire Come set me ablaze And I will be a living sacrifice All my heart and soul to glorify I offer nothing less than all my life For Jesus Christ I just want to bless you, Lord I just want to bless you, whatever it takes, with my mind and my body, my spirit and strength. Oh, we know you're a fire, Lord, if you are a fire. Come set me ablaze And I will be a living sacrifice All my heart and soul to glorify I offer nothing less than all my life For Jesus Christ Fall, fire, fall, fire, fall, come consume me. I'll give you all, give you all of my worship. Fall, fire, fall, fire, fall, come consume me. I'll give you all, give you all of my worship. Fall, fire, fall. Fire fall, come consume me. I'll give you all, give you all of my worship. Fall, fire fall, fire fall, yeah. I'll give you all, give you all of my worship. Fall, fire fall. Fire fall, come one more time, yeah, I'll give you all, give you all of my worship. Fall, fire fall, fire fall, come consume us, Lord. I will be a living sacrifice. All my heart and soul to glorify I offer nothing less than all my life For Jesus Christ One more time 
and I will be a living sacrifice. All my heart and soul to glorify. I offer nothing less than all my life for Jesus Christ. Felt led to bring my wife up. Come over here. Get in the middle here. You're awesome. Yes. You know, she had a last Sunday. I was just, you know, during worship. I just said, "Hey, honey, could you just pray for me and just see if you got anything? You know, what does the Lord release? You know, not just over me, but over our church." And get home from church, and the Lord, man, just dropped a, just dropped a word in her heart that I think that I think some of you need to to embrace and. You know, you don't have to worry about writing it down because you can go out back on the life. You could go back later and, and, and get it word for word. So you don't have to feel, you could just receive it now and then and go back later and you can kind of write it down in your own journal. But while she's finding that, I just want to also say for those of you that know, some of you may know or don't know, Vivian Plord uh, passed away this week mm-hmm. and uh, she's in heaven. And just wanted to let you also know the family said that her wishes when she passed that she didn't want to have a funeral or anything. Um, she donated her body to the U of M. But I, as I talked with her our daughter and, and brother, um, they said that what they, they want to do is they want to schedule a time where their family can, they want to come to church in her honor. And when that day comes, I'm going to honor Vivian. Yes. So we're going we're gonna to have something for her, a little, it's kind of like, I remember I preached last week, Jesus is preaching and he stops and what does he do? He honors John the Baptist. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do that when Vivian's family comes. But um, just um, just want you to know before she passed, we had the most beautiful conversation. You know, usually when people are in a situation like that, the Lord will stir my heart to ask this question, Vivian. You know the testimony in our church. You know that God heals, right? She goes, yes. And I said, I have a question for you. How do you want me to pray for you? Do you want me to pray for you in, in lieu of you being healed and restored because you know God can do that? Or do you want me to pray and help you walk you to heaven? How do you want me to pray? She says, Pastor Steve, I've already sought the Lord on this. I asked the Lord if there's anything left for me to do. He told me there's not other than a few family things. She goes, Pastor, I'm ready to go home to be with Jesus. And I said, Vivian, that's how we're going to pray. And it was so beautiful that we got to spend time together talking about heaven and just walking her, walking her and just giving her that permission to let go and get in. And when I got the call, her her daughter said she just went. There was no struggle. It was like when it was her time, you know what? When you're a believer, that's how we all should go home. There shouldn't be a struggle. It should be like when it's your time, you breathe your last and you you go home. And and so please, um, just keep her family in prayers and because I asked, you know, what she wanted to do, and that's what the family said at this time. So I will um, let you know when that is. Um, her, her, uh, I gave her some ideas of when would be a good time for that to happen, but the family will let me know. And had a great chat with Vivian's uh, son, and it was just a great divine time that time. But, you know, the whole family, they're, of course, they're saddened, but at the same time, they know where, where mom is. And, and they, they knew that they were ready for her to go home and but Vivian, I, I just miss her because she was always an encourager. She would call me, write a note, or every Sunday she always would just, has always something encouraging to say. And she was such a precious woman of faith. You know, but not, some of you didn't know this, but she had a nasty car accident in the summer. And she survived that. I mean, that was a, I mean she's, she's just this petite, cute little thing. And she had this really nasty car accident. But, man, she survived that. She got through that. And I'm like, wow, like... It's like, and she's just smiling, and, you know, and I had no idea, you know, she kind of kept things private. I had no idea she was battling cancer, and, 
And once we found out about that, we started praying and believing that God would, would, would restore, heal, and, and bless her. So a lot of you know her. You know, she always did sit either back there or back over here. And she's a part of the Bible study on Sunday mornings and other things like that. So she was dear to many of us. And we miss her. <laughs> we miss her. And so, honey... Could you just release that word that, that the Lord put on your heart? I believe that what, what, it's so fitting for what God's doing this morning. So um, I had just taken a few moments and put the keys to hearing God's voice into practice. And <laughs> um, it's a little plug for our Tuesday night study. Um, and just asked the Lord, God, how do you see our church in this season? And he said to me um, that... Our church is a home for his glory in Mora, Minnesota, and he is so grateful for our church. He says he is not disappointed or worried one bit, but he is thrilled that he has a home here. He said that we are on a roller coaster riding the ups and downs and do not get off the ride, but find joy. Yeah. He is preparing mountain movers for this next generation at Living Hope Church for generations to come. But we are called to ride the waves of the roller coaster until he stops the ride and gives a new adventure. He is filled with joy to partner with us. Our church is existing in this season in bringing light to dark places. This is a season of faithfulness and on the ride, uh, faithfulness on the ride and joy. So. Could you just pray into that word over us this morning? Just yes. pray, intercede into that. That's such a powerful word of encouragement. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this home for your glory. We are so thankful that you have called Living Hope Church one of your places that you can come and dwell and be among us and walk with us and sit with us. And we just are so grateful for your glory and your presence here with us. God, we thank you for those that um, are on this ride and riding the ups and downs and in this time in this world where... Um, you said that in this world you may have trouble, but take heart, for you have overcome the world. That we ride the waves, we ride with joy, and we, um, we will not get off until you tell us it's time, Lord. And we thank you for what you're doing here, and we thank you for, um, for those that are just watching us ride. And like, wow, look at those people and the joy that they have on their journey. And God, we just thank you for the joy and your joy, which is our strength. And so, Lord, we um, just ask for your blessing, your continued favor and your blessing um, over your home here. And we just give it to you, Lord, for your glory. We thank you for the people whose hearts and lives that you want to touch and heal and minister to. And for those that are riding the ups and downs without you, God, we ask that you yes. would you would draw them to yourself, that yes. they could ride those ups and yes. downs and have joy instead of despair. Yes. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Come on, somebody. It's, you know, I was just the other day kind of doing what Larry was doing, kind of cleaning the house. And, you know, I, God speaks to me in the craziest places, you know, whether, you know, the gym or whatever. I was just cleaning the house. And and the Lord just dropped this nugget in, in my heart yesterday as I was cleaning and vacuuming, trying to bless my wife so she comes home. She comes home to a clean house. That's good husband stuff right there. <laughs> and uh, so the Lord said, he said, to, he asked me this question. He goes, why do I send prophets? And I'm like, Lord, no, I'm not going to, I'm going to say, I want him to tell me. <laughs> said, why do you send prophets? He goes, why do I send prophets? He says, Lord, can you tell me? He goes, I send prophets because of this. When, when is my people were in times of despair and trouble, I always sent a prophet because one word of encouragement can, can, can clean thousands and hundreds of years of despair. That's the power of the prophet, is that Israel at times were in great despair and trouble, but when they were, what did God do? He would send a prophet to do what? Release a word. And sometimes that one word of encouragement would, would, would set in place restoration and healing, that, that all the years that they encountered despair and discouragement, that one single word. And many of you in this room know, when you're going through a difficult time, the power of an encouraging word can carry you through a season. And it might not carry you through a week, a month, it can carry you through years. Look at Abraham. God spoke to him, and God spoke to him one time. He moved his family, and it was years until he got another revelation. 
How many of you are willing to trust God like that? How many of you are ready to move on faith with one word and God doesn't speak to you for like another 30 years? <laughs> are you willing to do that? Are you willing to move your family from a place of comfort to the unknown? And, Sarah's, and Sarah followed. That's the craziness of it. So just want to encourage you, that word that Ginger spoke, what a word we needed in this season. And, and many of you also, I know you're hearing the Lord in this season, and your God's speaking to you as well, and God's been speaking to me, and it's so good. And, and, and so if you got your Bibles today, we want, to, we want to jump into a message called Victory Over Pain. And we, it's kind of interesting, this series is so timely, and the Lord is just, he's directing us, he's leading us. And He's, and so, so the beginning of this series is focusing on case studies. It's, we're studying like key significant Bible characters and how each of them, famous they were, suffered with a lot of emotional stuff. And guess who we're learning about today? None other than Jesus. Man, we all think Jesus had it all together. You know, he what? He was perfect in all ways, yet did not sin. So he did have it together. But because he, was the, he, because he was the son of God, the Bible says he was also the son of man. Because he's the son of man, it meant that he also goes through pain, suffering, and sorrow like we do today. The, the good thing is, is that he gave us a blueprint. Because he is the son of God and son of man. He, he walked into some things that many of us are in right now and are walking through. And because of our great high priest, because of Jesus... Because of what he did for us, he gave us a pattern. He gave us a path and some steps that if we look at his life, we could, we could lean into that and we could follow him too. And before, while you're turning into Matthew's gospel, we're going to go to Matthew 26. We're going to spend time in verses 20, Matthew 26, 30, uh, 26 through 36. And while you're turning there, just going to put up the offering slide. For those of you that are watching online, you're, you're timing in. There's, a, there's, you can, there's different ways that you can give, and we got offering boxes outside here for those in person or, or as well. You could give on, online this way through our website, through that. And we are so thankful for your generosity this season. And because of the technology issues we've had, your generosity allowed us to get a new router so that we could, you know, get things, get things back online. So thank you, Jesus. And, and God is, you know, God is using this church to reach so many people in this season. And and so many people have been so gracious that we are online and that we are doing some things. And, and for those of you watching online, again, another invite, I would like you to come to our Friendsgiving on November 14th. That would be so awesome if you could make the journey to Mora for that. It would be a great day. So as we're going to Matthew 26, um, 26 through 36, as we go to the unshakable logo, this is the prophetic picture that God wants for us to be. This is his blueprint for us. This is the picture that he wants all of us to become. And I'm going to declare, and Father, as I preach this message, I declare this church and its people will be emotionally strong in difficult times. Father, I prophesy that. I declare that, that no matter what comes our way, we will be emotionally strong in difficult times. Father, we will be the lighthouse that stands in the storm. We will have a secure, firm foundation that's lined to the chief cornerstone. We will stand. We will not bend. We will not break. We will not fall down. But we will stand strong in the storm and we will shine our light no matter how difficult it may be no matter how much is coming at us I declare we are the foundational people that will stand strong in the storm shining light in this next season in Jesus name I declare that that's who you're becoming you may not sense it right now but you're becoming that that's God's goal for life is to become that no matter how old or young you are that is the picture that God wants you to be and become for the next season because if we're not that, there's no hope for the world. We're the, final, we're the final line before chaos. We have to hold the line, and this is how you hold the line right here. You stand strong in the storm. You shine your light because those that are discouraging need a home. And, they, and guess what? Lighthouses direct people in storms to a safe place place into a safe harbor each of you today are a safe place each of you are a safe harbor and when you're standing strong in difficult times and you're shining your light God's gonna draw people to, I believe man he's drawn people to this church he's already drawing them he will draw them sometimes God prepares before he engages we're in a season of preparation church you're in a season of preparation do you realize it took Jesus 30 what was it, 37, was it 30 years? Yeah, 30 years. It took Jesus 30 years of preparation to accomplish what he did in three. 
So what makes you think that God can do something quick in your life? Because God is more about a process. You know, there's breakthroughs and healings. We celebrate that. But God is more of a process than he is a God of, of, of the instant. He always sets us in a process. That's why, there's, that's why we go up the hill, we go to the peak for a moment, and we go down the hill, through the valley, up the hill. That's the process of the spiritual road and journey. Kind of like the roller coaster Ginger was prophesying. It's like we're going, we're going up, and we enjoy the celebration at the top. Then we go down, we go through, we go up. I mean, that's the walk of the Lord. And that's what we're on in this season, and the Lord is teaching us how to navigate through difficult times. See, did you know that Jesus struggled with his emotions? The Bible says he, he was, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke talk about this very thing in John. They talk about this situation in the Garden of Gethsemane, which means oil pressing. I mean, it's the oil press. So pick the picture where Jesus was at is a picture of he's being pressed. He's in a difficult place. But we also know that's where the anointing comes from. The greater the crushing, the greater the anointing on the other side, the greater the power we have the greater anointing we walk in when we go through the crushings. That's the blessing on the other side of this for us, is that some of you, as you walk through what you're going through right now, there is a breakthrough on the other side, and there's an anointing available there, but you got to go through this first. So Jesus' soul was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, the Bible says. He was in anguish. He was exhausted from sorrow to the point of what? Sweating blood. And that actually is a medical condition, by the way, when you sweat blood, that means you're under severe duress. None of, I've never sweat blood before. I'm not sure if you have, but Jesus was the son of God, son of man. That was not something supernatural. That was actually a physical condition you could get when you're under extreme stress and difficulty. You could actually sweat blood. Jesus did that. And we also get another description of, of what Jesus was on earth because it says that in, 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 in Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 5, right here, it says, I'm going to go to Hebrews here for a second. Hebrews chapter 5, it says 7 through 10. It says, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears for the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission, so that through, he, through though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey, obey him and was des designated by God to be a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. You could see that Jesus, while he was on earth, struggled, crying in tears. So we also see today that Jesus wasn't immune to the emotional struggles while he lived life on earth. But guess what he did? He found victory over his pain. When he was sorrowful, when he was troubled, distressed. And it, we see in this passage, wanting to quit. We're going to see today he did two things. Let's pick it up in Matthew 26, verse 20 to 36. He says, then Jesus, when Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, he said to them, sit here while I, while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, with him and began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to his friends, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here. Keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed. This is the first time he prayed. My father, and, and, and look at the language as he processes this. He says, my father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples, found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked. Then he asked Peter, Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Then he went away a second time and prayed. Now notice the language changes. The first time he prays, he says, if it's possible. Now he prays the second time. My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he found him sleeping because their eyes were heavy. He left them and went away once more. So he prayed a third time, saying the same thing, meaning the same thing he prayed before. He said, my father, if it is not possible for me 
Take this cup unless I drink it. May your will be done. After the third time he prayed, he returned to his disciples and he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. As we look at this passage, there's two things that we could overcome victory. Jesus did two simple things to overcome his pain. Number one, in verses 36 through 37, the first thing is, which is also, you're going to see the foundation of this, whole, of this whole last few weeks. The Lord is trying to show us through all these different Bible characters, there's a plumb line to this message. It is number one is being in the presence of his close friends. Number one is if we're going to have victory over pain, you're going to have to learn how to be, pre be present, be, be in the presence of your close friends. You notice here in this specific passage, there were 12 disciples. He left, he left a few behind and grabbed his closest friends. He grabbed four. Eight were behind, four went with him. He had James and John, Peter, and he had Jesus, the four of them. All the other disciples were, they, they were with him, but he took his, what? In his, in his worst distress and troubling time, he grabbed those that were closest to him. That's important for us, that when you're going through a difficult time, who are your close friends? Because you know you're not going to get victory over your pain unless you learn to be in the presence of close friends. And you're going to notice, when you're in the presence of close friends, it's not a gossip session. It's not a whine and complain, woe is me session. You're going to see Jesus did two things with his friends that got him the first step, helped him get victory over pain. And, and this is what he did. We see it in verse 36 through 37. He says, Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. He said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. But he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watching. But you know what? Some of the best thing you can do for a friend going through a tough time, stay with them. Stay with your friend. Military of a term, don't leave, your, don't leave anyone behind. You know what? When your best friend is going through a difficult time, or when you're going through a difficult time, one of the best things you can tell your friends is, you know what, I don't need you to talk to me, but I need you to stay with me. Just can you stay with me? Don't give up on me. Come on, somebody. Don't give up on me and don't let me go. I need you with me. I need you with me in this season. See, Jesus needed James and he needed John and Peter. Why? Because those are the anchors, the apostles of the next move of God. And Jesus needed his closest friends with him. He needed the sons of thunder. Come on, somebody. He needed the rock, Peter. That's who his close friends were. Sons of thunder and a man by the name of Peter was a rock. Who, who are the Peters in your life? And who are the James and Johns in your life? The people that John had. John was really close to Jesus. And so Jesus, because when your friends are with you there, you got to stay with them and don't give up on them. He, you know what, do you realize that, that Jesus is really humbling self in this passage? And so here's what it says. What did he do in the presence of his close friends? Well, in verse 37 and 38, we could see here he opened his heart up to his friends. We see that here in verse 37. He took Peter and, and the two sons of Zebedee along, and, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. He began to be sorrowful and troubled. He opened his heart up to them. This is what he said. He, he said to them, my soul's overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. So he opened his heart up to your friends. When you're going through a difficult time when you got your close friends, you don't whine, gripe, and complain. What you do, though, is you get real, you get transparent, and you tell your friend, I'm overwhelmed. You call it out. You call out what you're facing. You don't stuff it. You, don't, you, you give it a name. You, you, you take it from the dark shadows and you plop it on the table and let light shine and say, look, this is what I'm dealing with. Jesus said, he called out. He goes, my soul is overwhelmed to the point of death, guys. What I am facing right now, man, you may not understand, but I am going through it. He called it out. His, he, he admitted. He admitted that, look, my soul's overwhelmed. This is the son of God, son of man talking. 
This is the man who casted out demons. This is the man who raised the dead. He's at a point of emotional distress where he's, he's at sorrow to the, point of his, to the point of death. He's really struggling here. But he opens himself up. He humbles himself before his disciples. And he lays out his heart before them. He's asking them, guys, I need you to stay with me. Everyone else may have walked away from me, guys, but I need you with me right now. You know what happened at the supper, man. Judas walked away. Come on, don't you walk away from me either, and don't you betray me. I need you with me. I need you to see. Sometimes you, need, you just got to stay with your friends. You got to stay with them and don't give up on them. Even when, even like Job, he, he, his friends stayed with him. The problem with Job's friends is they started to talk. But that's okay. But Job just needed his friends there. And sometimes when difficult things happen, there's not an, we don't have, an, some of us don't have an explanation for why we're going through what we're going through. Now, if you made dumb choices, yes, you could explain it. But a lot of the things that hit us in life are unexpected. And we don't have a grid for it. And that's why we need friends to stay with us and encourage us. And Jesus models that for us. But how you, this is, but the scripture does give us clues. And how do we open up our heart the way Jesus did? Well, James 5, 13 and 16 gives us a great model. He says, if you are in trouble, you shall pray. If you're in trouble, call upon the elders of the church that they may anoint you with oil and they may lay hands on you. And if in a sick and the sick person and the prayer of faith offered will make the sick person well. But in the same context, what does it say? Confess your sins to one another that what? That you may be healed. You know what? You're not going to get healed in your pain until you, until you confess it. I'm not talking, like, confessing it. Like, going to a close friend and saying, opening up the door of your heart and saying, I deal with depression to the point of suicide. That's naming it. That's getting it out to the open. It's raw. It's real, but it's 100% transparent. And you know what the Bible says about that? Remember a few years ago, Genesis 2.25? Remember I had a prophetic word about God wants to do Aram and Morah? Aram is the Hebrew word for nakedness. Genesis 2.25 says, Adam and Eve were naked and what? Felt no shame. If you're shame and you, if you're, if you're too shameful to share your pain with somebody, you're not naked. Because true healing comes when you get naked and exposed to your friends. Meaning, you're unveiling who you really are. You're unveiling the ugly and dirty side of your heart. That you, you know what? If the world found out about it, it would be great TV. But when you're amongst your close friends, you need to unveil who you really are. That's what it, and do it without shame. That's called Aram in the Hebrew. And what's Aram spelled backwards is M-O-R-A. I believe the breakthrough for Mora is when people in this town start getting a little transparent. Instead of hiding your garbage, you get it out. Get around some close friends. Don't try to stuff it. Don't try to hide it and act like you're, you got it all together. No, it's the opposite. It's when you start getting around some close friends saying, I'm struggling right now, and I'm in pain right now. And if, I don't, if God doesn't come through for me right now, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this. It's getting to a point of ultimate transformation and authenticity that you could stand before somebody and unveil the trueness of your heart without being shamed or judged. And when moms and dads could do that before their kids, and when kids could do that before their moms and dads, when you could do that before your brothers and sisters and even the members of your church, when you could start being real and transparent, that's when the real healing comes. But if you're not willing to get there, you're not going to be healed, and you're not going to have victory over your pain. You're going to be going year after year, church after church, trying to find healing for something when we really, you just got to open it up and get it on the altar let God deal with it. Jesus is doing that. He's opening his heart up. And that's how we, we confess. You confess your junk to one another that what? You may be healed. The first thing I tell somebody when I'm counseling them, and when they open up their heart, and they say, Pastor, you're probably going to judge me. And I look at them and says, no, I'm not, because let me tell you what I've been through in life. And let me tell you what I'm going through right now. So there's nothing you're going to say that's going to scare me. And this person starts sharing. And after they share, I say this. You're already on the path to healing. What do you mean? The Bible says when you confess your sin to one another, you're going to be healed because you confessed it. 
because you called out the dirty closet you haven't been, you've been hiding for these years. You finally decided to get the key to it, open it up and lay it down. You started confessing it. What you've just done is you've put yourself on a track to be healed, restored, and delivered from this sin or from this dirty stuff that's been hiding in your heart. Church, if we're going to get to the next season, we cannot be ashamed of who we really are. Before God first, we need to come before God that way. I am naked. I am under, Lord, you, God knows anything. The Bible says he already knows anyway. You know, the Bible says he knows your secrets. He knows what you do. You're, you're, you can't hide from God, all right? Adam and Eve tried to hide from God. They couldn't. God called them out on it. And, but God didn't judge them. God brought fig leaves. And guess what? That's called restoration and recovery. That's called the cross. That's called the blood of Jesus. Adam and Eve got healed and restored from that because God has healing for you too. But, but what we often do, instead of going to God and others to be real and transparent, we try fig leaves. Fear, insecurity, guilt, loneliness, escapism, failure, and, and, all, the, and all these things are fig leaves that we put on it rather than getting open and naked before the Lord. So that's how we, when we get around our close friends, we got to open up our heart and be honest and real and transparent. Be naked and feel no shame. Get before someone and say, man, I know I missed it. I blew it. But, you know, just by you confessing that. But you know what? There's no, you don't have to worry because if you're around your close friends that love you anyway, it's okay to be real, honest, and transparent because Jesus knew his boundaries. There's things that he could share with these three that he couldn't share with the other eight. Come on, somebody. There are people in your life that you could share things with, and there's some things that you just can't share with others. So there's Jesus held great boundaries in his relationships. He didn't share, he didn't share this with the crowds that were following him. He didn't share with the other eight, even though he loved the other eight. It was these three guys that he was closest to where he could uncover it all and not be judged and not feel shame and not feel guilt. The second thing we do when we're in the presence of close friends is he asks his friends to pray with him. We see that at 38b. In verse 38b, he says, stay, with me, stay here and keep watching me, pray with me. And that's another thing is, do you realize this is the first place this is the first place in Scripture where actually Jesus asks his disciples to pray for him. It's important. What humility, our Savior. Jesus was such in a place of humility, not only, not in a place of transparency and authenticity, he was in a place of humility where he said, <clears throat> this is the Son of God asking his friends to pray for him. See, pr asking someone to pray for you is, is, hum is humbling. It's how pride gets, sometimes pride likes to get in the way, but when you, when you get open and transparent before your friends and then you follow it up with, hey, can, now that I've shared this with you, can you pray with me? Could you, could you stay here? Yeah, I love that because how many times when someone is sharing their heart and it is so nasty, you'd rather run away from your friend than stay with them. We can't do that in this season. This is not the time to run away from things. This is the time to, to get into the dirty with your friend. And when your friend is willing to share their heart with you, Jesus said, now that I've shared this with you, can you stay here a while and pray for me? I remember I have a good friend of mine who pastored a church. If I, if I tell you the name, you know, you would, you would know this, but for the sake of confidentiality, but he's a very popular pastor that I look up to, and it took, first of all, he was in a town that, man, it took, him, it took him more than five years before his first convert came to the Lord. And then, as he was pastoring his church, someone came into his office and just berated him and criticized him of all the things he wasn't doing. And <laughs> this is what he did. He got up from his chair and he got down on his knee and says, can you pray for me to be a better pastor? Wow. That's humbling when you ask people to pray for you. That's how we become close friends. That's what close friends do in difficult times. We get open, honest, and transparent. Then we get to the next place where heal true healing comes when we, inv when we invite 
the presence of God. The Bible says when two or more are in agreement, the presence comes. So when you can agree in prayer with a friend who's going through a difficult time, God promises to be there. And in that point, when you invite the presence, when two or more are together, guess what? Chains are broken. Freedom comes. Healing comes. Deliverance comes. The po- we can never short... We can never shortchange the power of prayer in a difficult situation. And Jesus is showing us the pattern. He's showing us how to get breakthrough, how to get victory over our pain. He's given us the blueprint. Jesus asked for prayer because he's modeling it for us. Like, look, when you're in a difficult, I'm in a difficult time, you're in a difficult time, this is how you do it. You ask for prayer. Also, too, we could see in this passage, we also know that at the same time as it's, as it's, Jesus is modeling it, I think behind the scenes in the undercurrent of this passage is he's really testing his friends. Because we also see that his friends were tired too. And his friends were weary. And we also know that sometimes we can overwhelm our friends with our problems. And that's why I think maybe Jesus did that. Maybe, maybe Jesus, maybe the disciples, they st- the good point is, here's the good thing about the disciples is when you don't have all the prayers to pray, you don't have all the words to stay, just stay there. You know what? Yes, the disciples grew weary with heaviness. They were also grieving. And and I think when Jesus uncovered his sorrow to the point of death, that brought something on the disciples to the point, whoa, whoa, Jesus. And then Jesus says, can you pray for me? And the disciples are very thinking, how do we pray for that? You're the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And You're asking us to pray for you. The disciples probably felt overwhelmed with that. And and, and so what happened is they tried to pray, but they fell asleep a few times. But let's not rebuke the disciples because I think the most important thing they did is they didn't run. Even when they didn't understand how to minister to Jesus, how to give him the right words, at least they did the most important thing. They stayed. Sometimes that's the best thing you can do is let your friend talk. Let the Holy Spirit lead it. And if need be, try your very best. But at least what you're doing is you're staying there. We just need some people to stay in this season. We need some people to stay in the fight. We need some people to stay in the battle. We need some people to stay in the pain. And God, and as we become that lighthouse that's what God's going to do for us in the next season as we're getting emotionally strong he's going to he's going to position us to be that for people so he was really testing the faith and the strength of his disciples and and Jesus is just reminding us the key the key to finding strength in this next season is is prayer it's just being people of prayer because he even calls it out he goes you couldn't even watch with me for one hour guys seriously and why does Jesus say that? I think he's teaching us something. Let's just go beneath the level of, this, of that verse for a second to say this. Maybe Jesus is saying to us today is that when you're in emotional pain, you may have to be in God's presence for more than an hour to get healed. Not to say that a five-minute prayer ain't going to do it or a ten-minute prayer is going to do it or a drive-by prayer to work's going to do it. No, it can happen. But maybe the real issue, Jesus, is going to look, guys, when you're carrying what I'm carrying, it's going to be a lot longer than it's going to. It's going to be a lot longer than 20 minutes. It might take you an hour. Are you willing to spend an hour with the Lord? Are you willing when you're in a place of breakthrough? Are you willing to spend an hour with a friend too? Are you willing to take an hour to hear what a friend has to say and to offer prayer? Jesus said, "Could you not watch for one hour?" Because He's given us a clue that some of the breakthrough that we need is probably an hour away. Come on, somebody. This, 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 this picture that if you're willing to spend an hour, maybe more, Jesus is just giving us a clue to how we get breakthrough in difficult times, how we get victory over pain. It's, he's showing us there's a process that's in place. And the process may not be quick. It may take some time. Are you willing to stay in the process? Are you willing to stay in the process with the people that you love? So that's number one, is being in the presence of close friends. In verse 39, Jesus says, going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father. So this, the first thing is, forgive victory over pain, is we be in the presence of close friends, and you take heed of what I just said. The, sec- the final point is, when we're going to find victory over pain, is being in the presence of the father. Because why? Because people are great. But where we really get breakthroughs in the presence of the Father, because you know what? We also know this, that people are going to let us down. 
You know, the disciples weren't trying to let Jesus down in that moment, but Jesus realized he, Jesus knew where his true source came from. He, he was inviting his friends in because he was close to them, and that's, that's important. We need, peop- we need close people around us that will stay with us, but ultimately your breakthrough will not come by people alone. You need the presence of God. You need to make yourself available to God's presence. And what did Jesus do? He dropped himself to the ground and he said, my father, he started to pray. He prayed three times. So he was, and what, when Jesus was, so when we're in the presence of close friends, now we're in the presence of the father. What did, what, Jesus did two things when he was in the presence of the father. Let's look at it in verse, the second part of verse 39. He says, my father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. So this, what he shows us, when we're in the presence of the Father, Jesus embraced his suffering, and he accepted it, even though he was overwhelmed to the point of death. The first thing we can do when we're in God's presence is come to a place of acceptance. Come to a place of, what did Jesus do? He called it out. He, he said, my soul's overwhelmed. Jesus called out his suffering. He gave the suffering a name. He didn't keep it in the dark. He called it out. My soul's overwhelmed to the point of death. Jesus was confessing. He was bringing out, the, calling out the pain. And, and at the point here, he's starting to pray about embracing it. We know it took him three times to accept God's will, but it shows us that he's struggling to get to that place of surrender. It took him three times to get to a place of surrender where he could say, Lord, all right, if it is not possible to take this cup from me, let your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done. It took him a while to get to surrender, but he got there. But Jesus was what? He was embracing his suffering. He was accepting it. And Paul, when he accepted his suffering, said, the Lord told him, my grace is sufficient for you. Do you realize that when you embrace and accept the suffering you're in, there is a supernatural grace and power that comes to bring healing and strength to your situation. We also see in verses 39, 42, 44, three times Jesus prayed and to accept his Father will. And then we see in verses 45, 46, Jesus finally surrenders to his Father's will. So he goes through that process. But let's look at another situation just by a few phrases that Jesus did on the cross because I think for us to really understand how to embrace suffering and pain, we can look at four sayings on the cross because when Jesus was suffering and dying on the cross, he was also in a place of pain and suffering and torment. And here's, so when we look at these four phrases that Jesus spoke while he was on the cross, it gives us a pattern of how we can accept pain and get victory in it. The first thing he did is he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What's he, what's he demonstrating with that? He's calling out his pain. My father has forsaken me. He says, my God, my God, why are you forsaking me? The first step, he's addressing the pain. Secondly, he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He's entrusting himself. When he says, Father, into your hands, what he's doing is, okay, I'm recognizing the pain. My Father has forsaken me in this moment, but right now I choose to commit myself into the Lord. I'm entrusting my life into my Father's hands, even though I feel like he's forsaken me. He's processing his pain. He called it out. He's asking, he's committing himself to the process. Thirdly, he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And that is a key to getting victory in your pain, church is that Jesus did not wait till after the resurrection to forgive those that hurt him. No, you forgive in the pain. When you get beat down and beat up by somebody in your life, you don't wait. You don't hold on to it. You forgive now. You forgive in the moment because forgiveness is what releases healing. You forgive in the pain, church. Jesus modeled us, Father, forgive them for they do not know what to do. Most of the time that the people that hurt us, they really don't know they're hurting us anyway, so we need to forgive them. We know, they've, we know we've been hurt by somebody, but the person inflicting the pain may not know they're inflicting pain. So we need to forgive. Jesus modeled that, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. You need, we need to get into a habit of forgiving, forgiveness, accepting forgiveness from the Lord, releasing forgiveness to others, because that's what keeps you from bitterness. That's what keeps you from building walls in your life and strongholds forming is just living unoffended and keep forgiving and forgiving and forgiving and forgiving. And then finally, Jesus said this. How do you get victory over pain? 
Not only do we forgive, which is the key, finally he said, I find this really interesting that in his worst pain, he looked to a thief on the cross and, and reached him. Today you will be with me in paradise. What does that say? When you're in pain, you need to reach people. You need to, what I found is when I get into self-focus, I get into self-pity. And when I'm too focused on myself and I get into self-pity, I find that it's interesting. A phone call will come. A text message will come. Or this week, an invitation came to do ministry in Brainerd on a Friday night. And I'm like, Lord, Lord knows exactly what I need when I need it. When I'm going through my own stuff, the Lord gives me an invitation to do ministry on Friday night. Why? Because there's something about serving in the midst of your pain. It's about getting out of yourself and putting your focus on others that there's refreshment and encouragement there. I, I ministered on Friday night, and the people that came through my prayer line had no idea what I was been battling this last week. But when I get a report from the pastor that says that everyone came through your prayer line, you got spot-on prophetic words, I'm thinking, man, I didn't feel like I had it. But God, re- and guess what? On the way home on Friday night... I just felt something lift. There was just something like, something about putting your focus on others and getting out of yourself. Even though the people around you receiving minutes from you, they don't have a clue what you battled. They don't have a clue what you've been through. I remember I had a friend of mine, and he, um, he had heart surgery, open heart surgery, and he got a pacemaker put in, and he was fresh. He was actually fresh out of the hospital and he got asked to do some prayer ministry at a church. And they called him up, and he had some words of knowledge for people to get healed. And, um, and he, these people came forward, they got healed. And then he had a few other words of knowledge. And then he said to the people that just got healed, he says, all right. The people that came, the second group of people that came down for prayer, my friend says, look, you guys just got healed. Now you're going to pray for them. And Three of those people at the altar refused to pray. And here's what my friend did. He opened up his shirt and says, I have just had a pacemaker put in my heart. Guess what? Do you realize that a sick man just prayed for you and you got healed? And if God could use a sick man to bring healing to your life, what can you do? No, I'm not going to do that. (laughs) I'm going to scare people away. Especially when I turned 49 last week. We're getting to another level at that. But the point is, is focusing on others. I just look at the pattern of my life. When I'm in a funk, when I'm in a place where I'm discouraged, it's like a phone call will ring and say, Pastor, I need prayer. And I'm like, wow, what a great way to snap out of it. You know, what a great way to say, yeah. What, and I'm thinking, I'm, I'm praying, I, I put the phone on mute. I say, Lord, I need something because I don't got anything. And I put it, okay, how can I help you? And it's like, I'm blown away how the Lord, even in a moment of, of pain and discouragement, how the Lord can just minister through the vessel. And that's what he wants to do in all of us. And, and then Jesus said, you know, the second thing when he was in the presence of the Father was in, was in Hebrews chapter 12, you know, 1 and 2. He says, he says here, with the, by the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning his shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. When you're in the presence of the Father, Jesus was able to embrace the pain, but at the same point, it was like a, a joy was released in that moment. Like By the joy set before him, it's like, when he was in the presence of the Father, as he walked through the, the stages of surrender, when he got to that place of personal surrender, saying, Lord, not my will, but your will be done, it was almost like the Father released some joy into his life. He released something into his life that will, like Paul says, the grace came on Jesus to walk through the, the surrender and, and into the betrayal, into the, the getting arrested, following the courtyard, and, and then Pontius Pilate, and carrying the cross, and being nailed to the cross. It's like, in, in the sequencing steps, it was like there was a joy released on Jesus. There was something in that moment that, that the Father didn't take away the situation he was in, but God gave him a grace to endure what was going to come. And, but the joy set before him, he endured that situation. And, and we get that when we're in the presence of the Father. And then he says in some other verses previous to this, he says in John 12, 27, 28, 
He also says, my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. Wow. Father, glorify your name. What a great response to embracing pain. It's like, my soul's troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It's for this hour that I came. Wow. John 6, 30, 16, 33 says, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. And John, and then another thing is, as you read John 14 through 16, it's like, it's like John's version of, of, of the garden is, is in John 14 through 16. And we also see that in those chapters of Scripture, Jesus gives us important truth to finding the way. He gives us important truth to finding the way, the truth, and the life through pain. And, and some of the key points he highlights in these three chapters is this. He talks about trusting in the Lord. He talks about prayer and asking. He says, you have not because you ask not. In John 14 through 16, some of the best theology of the Holy Spirit is released. Why? And the context is when you're going through pain, that's when you really understand who the comforter is. That's when you really understand who the counselor is. That's when you really understand there's a teacher there, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, the comforter, counselor that we need. We're, we're more aware of the Holy Spirit in pain than we are in no pain. And a lot of people think, that, I don't think we know, that I said this before, we don't know what the comforter means until we're out of comfort. Because when we're in comfort, we don't know what the Holy Spirit means to be a comforter. But when you're in persecution and pain, you're going to have an understanding of what the comfort means. Because the Holy Spirit will be there. So Jesus promises these things. He, he talks about what it means to be abiding. And he talks about enduring persecution in John 14 through 16. And he talks about, look guys, I'm going to turn your grief into joy. He talks about the promise of peace throughout the whole discourse. He's saying, I'm going to give you my peace. I give you my peace. Come on. Peace I have, I give you. And he's reminding us we're going to have peace. And then he talks about eternity, that, hey, don't worry. I'm going to a place, but I'm preparing a place for you there. So even, even in difficult times, he's reminding his followers, look, guys, you've got you to get your eye on heaven and get your eye on something out of this world. Get your eye up there and... That will give you hope and peace in a difficult time. And, and Larry, if you could come, we're just going to close this, wrap this baby up here today. As I look at this, it's, remember, it's just the plumb line of this whole thing is being in the presence of others and being in the presence of the Father. Every character we studied up to this point, that was the foundation that they had in difficulty. Surrounding ourselves with good people and being in God's presence. You know, it sounds easy. It's difficult to do. <laughs> and today, we got greater revelation in what we do around our friends. We, we get real and transparent. We stay with them. We, we ask for prayer. Why? Because we have, that's how we start getting victory over pain. And finally, ultimate victory comes through being in God's presence. That's how Jesus was able to get to a place of surrender. That's how he was able to embrace his pain. That's how he was able to walk through what he did is because he knew his father and just a, few, just, just a few thoughts as I, as I meditate on this passage is if we're going to find victory over pain, remember it requires having a healthy, realistic view of life. Church, this is to get real for a moment. In this, where Jesus says in this world we're going to have trouble. So if we're thinking that we're not going to have any trouble or struggle, then you don't, got, you don't, then you don't read the same Bible I read. So we, we have to have a healthy, realistic view of life. We're, lit, we're going to have trouble. And we're going to have struggle. But Jesus gives us the good, good news. He says, take heart. I've overcome the world. Why? Jesus say, look, I'm the blueprint. You follow my ways. You follow my word. I'll give you a blueprint of how you can overcome trouble that comes your way. And then Paul assures us that grace will follow because we have grace in those times. The foundational principle, we, can't, we cannot leave these foundational principles of being in the presence of others and being in the presence of God. Also, when we talked about a week ago about responding versus reacting. And as Jesus walked through embracing his struggle, you could see that Jesus didn't react to this pain. He responded to the pain. There was a quote that I found this week from a psychologist. This person said this, Emotional pain or struggles is not something we choose. But emotional pain or struggles is something we must choose how to deal with. And as I was talking with my wife, she was saying when she used to work counsel at Teen Challenge, she would say, you know, one of the biggest things, my wife's, my wife's main wheelhouse is core beliefs. And she always would say this, what we believe affects your emotions. 
So what you believe will affect your emotions. If you have a healthy view of God, then that's going to affect your emotions. If you have an unhealthy view of God, that's going to affect your emotions. We have core beliefs. We have good core beliefs, and some of us maybe have some poor core beliefs, but what we believe affects our emotions. And so that's pretty foundational, too. And if you want to know more about that, I, I just, you can go talk to Ginger. She, she, man, she can wheel that stuff off like boom, boom, boom. I'm trying to encourage her to do a Bible study on that on Tuesday night because I think that would be, because that would be, that would be a fire right there. And finally, being careful during emotional hardship because we could fall into temptation. And that's something that Jesus was also teaching his disciples. He says, look, what you're going through right now, you're kind of on dangerous ground because when we're going through emotional pain, we could easily slide into the trap. And that's what Jesus was saying. He said, look, guys, couldn't you watch with me for one hour? Meaning, guys, I know, I know your flesh is really, really weak right now. Your flesh is overwhelmed with sorrow and grief. And Jesus was basically saying to his disciples that you're on dangerous ground because, because your, your spirit is willing, but your flesh is, is in a danger zone right now where there's a trap of temptation here in the garden. And he's just basically warning his disciples. And he's warning us today that when we're in emotional pain, we have to be awake and alert of the traps of the enemy because we could easily slide in to some things that... that that, you know, our spirit is willing to go after the Lord, but we got a flesh side that, that kind of gravitates there. And Jesus was just saying, look, you got to put that under control. And, and what he is saying is, is by being in the presence of others and being in the presence of God, we could get, we can get some, some strength back to where we could not fall into that temptation. And it just reminds me that it's not a sin to feel pain. But it is when we yield, give in, and allow it to take more of, it is when we allow it to take more of a prominent place in our heart than the Lord. Then that's the time when we need to surrender it over and resist it. So it's not a sin to feel pain or endure pain, but it's when we start giving the pain. It's kind of like what we're looking at in our Tuesday night Bible study. It's like, it's like putting an idol in our heart. It's Jesus is bigger than the pain you're carrying, but sometimes we can make the pain bigger than Jesus. And if we make the pain bigger than Jesus, then you're praying with an idol in your heart, and you gotta, you got you got you got to dismantle that sucker. So when we're in pain, we have to make sure that the pain isn't bigger than Jesus. We need to emphasize Jesus and the pain down here, not the other way around. And sometimes the enemy wants to get in there and makes and makes our pain the big deal. Wait, wait a second. No, pain's a big deal. Jesus talked about that. But when we get into God's presence, hopefully the, the God's presence shifts our heart from the pain being big to being God being bigger than the pain. And then that's when healing comes and breakthrough comes, and we realize that yeah, I'm hurting and I'm struggling, but I also serve a God who's bigger than this, and I just have to trust Him. I just have to put my faith in Him and. And let's just close with two responses today. One with an encouragement and one with something to think about. Remember this. Whatever you're in, whatever pain you're in, the Lord wants to remind you today that the other side of pain is always breakthrough. The other side of your pain will be breakthrough. So, looking at Jesus' example, what happens... What happens on the other side of Jesus' pain? What happens on the other side when he didn't quit? What happens when he endured suffering? Resurrection. Come on, somebody. The other side of your pain is a breakthrough. The other side of your pain is a resurrection. If you're willing to endure, if you're willing not to quit and give up, I'm telling you today the good news is, is the power of the resurrection is on the other side of your pain. Breakthrough is on the other side of your pain. Resurrection's on the other side of your pain. Doors are going to open on the other side of your pain. Transformation will come on the other side of your pain. When you're feeling this weighted down, oppressed pain, Remember, Jesus will lift you out of it and lift you out of the pit. And, he's, and I declare today, you will soar on wings of eagles. And you will run and not grow weary in the next season. Remember this, the 747 plane 
plane weighs 900,000 pounds, but yet it's through the thrust and the lip, take it to the clouds. And that's what Jesus does. That's what happens when you decide to get up instead of stay down. You know what? Someone said, if you get knocked down, it's good if you're on your back because if you can look up, you can get up. And that's what we got to do. When we get knocked down, we got to look up to get up. And why? Because the thrust and the force of resurrection life and power has the power to propel you out of depression, has the power to propel you out of emotional pain. Never forget that. Never forget that. That no matter what you're in, and arise, and it says in Isaiah, arise, shine, for your light has come. A deep, dark cloud covers the earth, but what? God's glory rises above you. So guess what? Arise and shine. God will raise you up and, and allow you to soar on wings like eagles once again. And, and if you're going to get there, you got to do this. You need the touch of the great physician. This is, this is your homework for right now or during the week. The touch of the great physician, because here's what it says in 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 7. It says, God is just. He will, I love this. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are in trouble and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. You need the touch of God on your life. If you're going to get victory over pain, remember, you need the touch of the great physician today. And even Luke 22, 43 says that in the midst of his pain, the Bible, Luke records, an angel came. In the middle of that pain, a, God released a supernatural touch on Jesus to get through. There's angelic promises. There's angelic strength. There's something, not, not angelic promises, but angelic power and strength. We're going to get off on that. I'm just in the moment here saying that there's a touch that God wants to bring to your life and your pain. And how do you receive this touch? Well, Jesus is the great physician, right? And it kind of reminds me of my old good friend, Dr. Pimple Popper. And so we're going to talk about that for a second. I don't know if you ever watched Dr. Pimple Popper, but she's on Lifetime and she's amazing. And it kind of reminded me that the pain we carry is like a cyst or a lipoma. And I don't know if you watch Dr. Pimple Popper, like people got these cysts and lipomas around their neck. They're on their back, and they look like basketballs in the, on their neck or their back. And it's really, it's flesh. It's either a cyst or it's just dead flesh. And they cover it up. They, they walk around with it. And all of a sudden, they realize they can't work with it. They can't live with it. They start being discouraged. They start feeling defeated. And, and eventually, it comes to the point where, you know what? i got to go see Dr. Lee. And she is this cute little bubbly doctor. And she walks and goes, oh, hello, how are you today? Oh, what's that at the back of your neck? I mean, she's so gentle. She's like Jesus. And, and, she, and the guy's like dejected, like, oh, man, I'm, I can't work anymore because I got this thing on my back. And the thing looks like a volleyball. And, and I'm thinking, this is going to get good. And then she, <laughs> she, she numbs it, and then she gets out a knife. And she gently makes an incision, and one or two things happen. Either it's a cyst and she pops it and it just squirts everywhere. And, or it oozes out like, like, like mashed potatoes. I'm, I know it's lunchtime. And it just oozes out like mashed potatoes. Or, or it's like a yellow piece of lipoma thing and she just <laughs> puts her hands in there gently and she just grabs it out and puts it on a scale and weighs it. <laughs> and sometimes they're like 15 or 20 pounds of dead flesh they've been carrying around. And the Lord is reminding me that's what he wants to do in our hearts. Some of us have been carrying something around that's just some piece of some, something in our lives and our hearts that's just dead weight. That's what the Bible talks about, oppression. It's like weight. Jesus said they were weight, though. Disciples were weighty. Jesus was overwhelmed. There's like a weighty, something, something was infecting their movement. And it's like Jesus is saying today, I have nails that can puncture that pain. Just like Dr. Pimple Popper, she comes in with a little exacto knife and just makes a little incision. It all comes out. See the nails that Jesus put into his flesh has the power and the ability to come into those infections 
and let his gentle touch cut into that. Let his gentle touch come in and remove that, that lipoma or remove that nasty cyst on your life. Let him squeeze it out. Let him come. He's gentle because when he heals, he, he heals gently today. And I want to challenge you this week when you get into God's presence, say, Lord, is there, is there something in my life that your nails need a touch today? Lord, I trust. Let your nails come in and just touch that area and pop it, remove it. Just get it out, Lord. Why? Because, you know what? He doesn't want you to, he doesn't want you to cover up that pain anymore, church. Come on. He doesn't want you putting hoodies over, over it. He doesn't want you trying to hide it. He doesn't want you trying to, you know, he doesn't want you feel defeated. He doesn't want you discouraged. He doesn't want your movement to be restricted because, you know, he's the gentle physician that just wants to come in and make an incision. And he just simply wants to take the nail and not pound it into you, but gently insert a nail into that pain and, and allowing, just allow it to pop. Come on, somebody. It's like, whoosh, let that thing come out. You know, so Father, I just pray right now as we're walking through this season of emotional discouragement, God, Lord, we ask that your nails would come into that infection and that pain. Father, that you would pop and remove that cyst, that you would remove that piece of flesh that's been we've been carrying around. Lord, we know that sometimes we feel the oppression of the world and the pain and the trouble of the world is crushing on us. And Lord, if there's any parts of our life right now that, that we feel oppressed, we're asking you today as the gentle physician to come in and, and, and bring the nails. And Lord, you, you, you took the nails so that we could be free. You took the nails so that we could be healed. You took the nails so that you can remove the infection of sin from our hearts and our lives and the pain that, that it causes. So, Father, we're asking you today, this week I pray that for our people, as we're taking time to be in your presence, begin to be a gentle healer and start repopping cysts or removing lipomas of our heart today, removing those infections so that why? So that, Lord, we know that when the infection is, is drained, healing comes. Well, that's, that's what doctors do. They they got to drain the infection in order for healing to come. Father, we're asking you today to, to touch and poke every cyst, every lipoma on your body. Touch it, drain it, remove it so healing can come, restoration can come, and deliverance can come today. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, somebody. I, I want to encourage you this week if go into God's presence and just... Let him touch those areas that he wants to touch today and let him heal what needs to be healed. And, and as we, before we go offline here for a moment, if we could put our offering slide back up and just want to encourage you, thanks for your giving and generosity. For those of you who are watching now or later and you come online, um, you could, this is how you could be a blessing to our church in this season. And, and finally, too, our friends' giving's coming up on November 14th, so we'd love you to be a part of that. It's going to be great. If you're watching online, I want to invite you to come to more of that Sunday. It'd be great for us to meet you in person and, and be a part of this because you're a part of our church too. And, and again, thank you and God bless today. Amen. And for those that are here, if you need prayer, please, I would love to pray with you today, especially if there's an area where, man, you just want breakthrough and healing. I'm available to pray with you today. If not, just greet and talk with those as you leave today. And, and thank you and God bless.